Welcome back everybody. So today we're going to dive into a follow-up to a video that I made a few days ago, which was hard truths about doing a PhD. And today we're going to get into some hard truths about doing a postdoc. And so I think that a postdoc is a wonderful thing. I think that the training that you're going to receive is excellent and it really does make a difference no matter what kind of career trajectory you're looking to, to have. However, there's a few things that people don't talk about when it comes to doing a postdoc that I think are really important to discuss. And that's what we're going to talk about here. And these are things that, you know, won't apply to everybody, but I do think are things that you need to be aware of as you're going into your postdoc or, or first starting your journey to set expectations and to know what you're working for. So without further ado, let's get into the first one. And the first one is that once you start your postdoc and you have your PhD, you've left the shelter of your grad school advisor. What do I mean by that? So when you're in grad school, you know, you're basically going to be going in there and learning the basics. You're going to be learning how to pipette if you don't already know how to pipette. You're going to be learning experimental design. You know, you basically have training wheels on. And once you go into your postdoc, those training wheels are off. Your PI is going to expect that you know how to read through the literature and find what you're looking for, that you know how to design experiments with proper controls that are going to address your hypothesis. They expect that you know how to perform certain techniques, and if you don't know how to perform that technique, that you have the ability to learn how to do it, either from a coworker or from a YouTube video or from, you know, wherever it might be, and maybe a methods paper. So you need to have in mind that when you're going into a postdoc, that it's no longer a mentor and mentee relationship. And some PIs are, are good about this. So when I worked, you know, my PI as a postdoc, what, what she really thought of us as, you know, continuing, you know, mentorship, but a lot don't. They really look at it as a boss and employee relationship. And you're really, you know, you've taken the training wheels off and you need to be able to go on your own and you need to be self-sufficient. So if you're not ready to make that jump yet, you need to think about, you know, what more you need to be doing within your PhD training to get yourselves ready so that when you do go into a postdoc position that you're ready to go on your own and you don't need quite the same level of oversight that you do when you're in grad school. Now, the second thing that builds off of that is results. Results matter. Now, do results matter when you're doing a PhD? Of course they do. And I think that one of the best things you could do in your PhD is to publish. And I think nowadays that's kind of the expectation is that you publish one or two you know, papers when you're doing your, your graduate work. However, as you're doing graduate work, if, if an experiment doesn't work or a project's not working, your PI has ways to maneuver things around to help you navigate to finish your degree, right? Because that's always the goal when you're doing a, a PhD is to finish the degree. When you're doing a postdoc though, it's different. Results matter. They have hired you with the expectation that you're going to be generating data and a lot of it. They want data for papers and for grants. They need you in order to continue their own grant writing. So for R01s, R21s, etc. cetera. Um, they need you to be able to produce your own grants and they need you to publish papers. And it is not uncommon that after a few years of being in a postdoc lab, if you haven't published something for your PI to come to you and say like, where is the paper? Like, I want to see a paper or two or three out of you. Um, so just have that expectation in mind that when you're going there, results matter. And it doesn't matter how long you have to work in the lab. You need to be able to produce data to generate papers. That's the thing that they care about the most. So just be ready for that, that the results really are the driving thing that you're able to produce as a postdoc. You don't have classes or defense or anything else. You're solely working as a as a as lab researcher. And this is probably going to be your most prolific research time spent in a lab is when you're doing your postdoc. Now, the next thing is that just because you have a good lab and a good PI doesn't mean that you're going to be successful. And I think that this is something that could be said about, you know, a hard truth in grad school. And we did talk about this that just because you have a good PI, you know, maybe you'll end up doing a little bit better, 
if you have a worse PI, maybe you'll do a little bit worse. And that's also true. But don't take into account the fact that just because you've landed in a good lab or at a good university that you're going to find success. Okay. Every person that's doing a postdoc is different. Some people need more attention. Some people need less attention. Some people need to be working on molecular techniques while others need more in vivo type of techniques. Everybody's going to have areas that they're good at. You know, what you want is to go to a lab where you're able to continue building on your strengths, but then get exposed to things that you're not quite as strong at. So for example, when I did my postdoc, I went to a lab where, you know, it was pretty split between in vitro and molecular and in vivo. And in my PhD, I had really built up a lot of strength in vivo, but my molecular and cellular lab work was lacking a little bit. And it was good because I was able to continue building on the strengths and utilize those for several projects where it was a lot of in vivo work. However, I was able to be exposed and start mastering some of the molecular and in vitro works that I wasn't necessarily exposed to as a graduate student. However, if I really had mostly focused in vivo as a PhD and I go to you know a top level lab at Harvard and they don't do any in vivo work and it's all molecular work, I'm gonna feel like I'm drowning as soon as I get there because I'm not gonna be used to that type of work. So it's really important that you keep that in mind as you're moving forward and think about how could I position myself to be in a good lab or a good university, but also be in a lab that I'm gonna be able to find success. The last thing is that when you go into research and you're doing a postdoc is you need to define success. This is one of the most important things that you can do as a scientist, whether it's in your postdoc or whether it's with a particular experiment or whether it's with a particular project. Being able to upfront define what you believe is success is really important. And it's something I do all the time. And I do this with my reports all the time is when we're drawing up an experiment and I ask them, okay, how would you define success in this experiment? What would success look like? And it's okay if our assay behaves in this particular way. But it's the same thing going into your postdoc is you need to be able to define what is success for you, okay? If success for you is being able to get a PI position, you have to keep in mind that it's gonna be hard to get that success. The fact of the matter is it's like less than 20% or something like this actually are able to convert from a postdoc over to a faculty position. So you need to define what's gonna be success for you and then what do you need to get there? So if your end goal is to become an independent PI, that's your, that is what success would look like if you were able to, to do that, okay? So then what things do you need to do throughout your postdoc to get there, okay? Well, obviously you're going to need to get, you know, like a K01 award or, or a K99, some sort of a career development award from the NIH or from, you know, a different society. So how could you get that? Well, you're gonna need to have papers, you're gonna need to have prior grants, you're gonna to need to have a lot of data, you're gonna to have to be presenting at conferences. So you need to start working backwards and then making a game plan. Okay, within year one, these are some of the things that I wanna do. Within year two, these are some of the things I wanna do. Keep in mind, this is gonna be fluid and projects are gonna you know, advance faster or slower than you plan, but you need to at least have some ideas going in about what you define as success and how you can reach that success. And also you need to just keep in mind that it is a very low level of people that actually convert from a faculty uh, from a postdoc over to an independent faculty member. So, you know, keep that in mind and make sure that you plan accordingly so that you're able to hit milestones, right? So milestones might be after two years having a grant, after three years having a paper, after five years having a career development award, you know, thinking about when you want to be hitting these milestones. So I hope this is kind of helpful. These are some things that I, I really think people need to consider when they're choosing where to do their postdoc and then, you know, as they're beginning their postdoc. So this is really geared for people that are in that late stage graduate school, early postdoc days, because these are things you're going to have to keep in mind in order to succeed once you make that transition over between going from graduate school to a postdoc and then, and then obviously throughout your postdoc. 
So if you found this video helpful, make sure to drop a thumbs up down below and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Bye.